Well, welcome everybody. My name's Marnie and it's so lovely to have you all here at Frankston City Library today. Um, we have May Linnell having a chat with Carly Lane. So it's a bit of a romance, uh, rural romance uh, afternoon, which should be lovely. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land on which Frankston City Libraries operate, the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. I'd also like to acknowledge the elders of any other communities who may be joining us today. Now, Carly has the, her new novel, Fool Me Once, coming in, which is out now, um, and Maya has Bottle Brush Creek, which is due out in June. So I will um, hand over to the ladies. If anyone has any questions, uh, please pop them in the chat box down the bottom, um, and I'll be able to read those out towards the end. So I will hand over to both of you. Beautiful. Thank you, Manny. Thank you. Right, so I guess I'll kick off and just say, Carly, I absolutely loved your book. So <laughs> I read it very, very quickly, and I think one of the best things about it is the lovely humour that you've got going through it, um, and also um, the real passion for rural living that you've got just shines through each and every scene. So I guess if we, if we talk a little bit about it and then we'll have, get into some questions about you, about your writing style um, and about the book as well. Does that sound good? Sounds good to me. <laughs> Excellent. So um, in For Me Once, we start off with Georgie Henderson and Michael Delacourt. Now, it's set in the beautiful New England region of New South Wales, which has got all those gorgeous trees that are changing colour at the moment. Is that right? Beautiful, yes. It's a good time of the year up there now. Yeah, yep. um, and so Georgie's working really hard to save her family farm, um, to, to buy back her family farm, sorry, and it kicks off at a B&S ball, which I thought was one of the most uh, innovative ways to start <laughs> a novel because there's always a lot of um, yee-hawing and larrikinism that goes on at a B&S ball, and, and this one that Georgie and Michael meet at is absolutely no different. Um, so... For those who don't speak fluent country, I guess we should explain as well that a BNS ball is a bachelor and spinsters singles ball <laughs> for people. Um, so Carly, how do you choose where to set each of your books? It kind of depends on, I guess, what story idea comes out. Um, I'm not even sure why. I just, yeah, I don't even know why I set that one there. I think it just was the opening scene I saw that she sort of sees this fellow across the room sort of thing. Um, but yeah, it just depends on where where your story is going to take place and what part of it appears to you first. I think. Yeah, and when you were writing it, did that come to you at the start, or did you do what I often have to do and chop, you know, ten thousand words of just jumbling <laughs> <laughs> of the start? Of the story. <laughs> uh, no, this one did always start there, which was yeah. Sometimes that's unusual. You don't always have your original start, but um, yeah, I don't know. I think that was the. The scene I saw having someone um, out of place. I always sort of like it when my characters are put in a place that they're not comfortable in. So sort of it's always a good icebreaker. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so the themes in your books, and I've read quite a few of your books and always really enjoy them because I feel that they're such an authentic portrayal. And I think that's really nice to, to nail that. Um, yeah. Family, we've got friendship, we've got the really nice friendship between uh, Shannon and Georgie throughout the story, which, which I love that, um, that friendship that's evolved over the years and, and they still stay in touch is really nice. Um, and strong women, so it's very relatable. I know you've got a real knack for writing the strong women. Why is this really important to you? I just, I, I don't know. I think I, when I first started writing, that's the sort of um, characters I really enjoyed reading. Um, it's a fine line between having like a strong character and one that's a little bit overbearing, but I hope mine are sort of more that, um, I don't know what it is, more that they, they find something inside them probably throughout the story than they don't necessarily know that they're particularly strong women, I guess, in a, in a lot of ways. They just find that during whatever's going on. And I think that's what happens in life. Sometimes you don't really know how strong you are until you're in a situation and you deal with it. So, yeah, they're the sort of realistic type people I like to put as characters. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think you do a really good job as well of, um, as well as shining the spotlight on the beauty of country living, 
and the magical settings that you've got and, uh, and the people that are involved in the communities. I think um, one of the really cool things is the way that you manage to dip into some of the darker themes as well and the, the issues that are really affecting our farmers. We're talking about drought, we're talking about depression, we're talking about succession planning and um, the corporations, you know, moving in on the small farmers. Mm -hmm. Why is that important to you to try and make sure that you've got the, the good mix of lightness and dark? Yeah, I think when I first started writing, I had... Um, too much of dark in one lit and it was really obvious you sort of you feel as you're writing if a book's sort of feeling too dark I think you do need to have that that balance so um I try to do that I think with a lot of it because there are a lot of really tough issues I think in in rural fiction in rural Australia and I guess that's just the way a lot of people deal with things too it makes it a little bit more authentic if you can you know, you've got to laugh or you'll cry in a lot of things. So I think that comes through a lot in the characters themselves. They have to have that little bit of humour. Yeah, absolutely. And I did. There was, some, there was a lot of times where I was laughing and I'm sitting on the couch and laughing away and the kids will look over and, what's on mum? Like, oh, look, she's just made this great comparison to the chaps always opening the doors, fridge doors. They were great manners, shower <laughs> doors. And, uh, it, was, it was a really good scene. Yeah. So, um, and there's also... Um, some really poignant scenes in there as well. So one that I particularly particularly liked is when um, Michael's comparing his family and what he's got to the relationship that um, Georgie has with her friend's family. So poor Georgie's on her own. She doesn't have her mum and she doesn't have her dad. She's got a really strong bond with the Sinclairs. And, and I thought that contrast there of um, Michael Delacourt, uh, Delacourt, who's got all this money and all this fantastic business, um, but he can really see and respect what Georgie's got as well. I thought that was really nice. Mm. Oh, thank you. Yeah, um, it was really, because they're not my normal characters in that sense. Um, I don't normally do, you know, the, the rich tycoon that comes in, um, but this was an earlier book for me. This was originally written before I, I become published. So, um, it had to be extensively reworked to get all the gag-worthy <laughs> scenes out. It was a little bit gaggy there for a while, but um, we hopefully got rid of most of those. And, yeah, but I think that it's sort of good to shake up your storylines a little bit. I like to sort of go between lots of different things. Um, and this was one of those things. I was a little bit worried. I thought it might not pan out as well as it has, thank goodness, because I wasn't sure how people would take the different types of characters that are in this one. But I think at the heart of it, they're all still from the country and they're all, they're all still living, you know, our problems. They've all got their problems. They've all got their issues. So they're people at the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think one of the really nice things about rural romance is just, it's the perfect escape at the moment, isn't it? When mm. people are stuck in their apartments and, you know, you probably feel the same as me that, it's a pretty tough time to be stuck in a small city apartment, whereas mm. I've got paddocks around us, we've got, mm. you know, room to roam. Um, I think the next best thing is to be able to have a story like this to take people away. Um, when yeah. They oh, definitely. Yeah. Uh, we really do have it lucky. I often think that looking outside, it's like, well, but um, yeah, hopefully people can take something away from it. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, so, Going on to your writing routine, Carly. Now, we were having a bit of a discussion about whether people are plotters, whether people are pantsers and they fly by the seat of their pants. And it always fascinates me the different styles that people use to create their books, so the different ways they work, whether they work with music, whether they work, you know, in a, in a cafe. Um, my eye did do a little bit of a twitch when you told me about the fact that you <laughs> don't write in methodical order and I'm in awe that you can just pull that <laughs> and beautifully. Can you tell people about that? Oh, I love that you call it a routine. That makes me sound like I'm so <laughs> organised. Um, my writing is probably, I don't know, I still sometimes sit there and think, I really wish I knew how real writers sat down to do this properly because I don't think I've ever really... I don't know, I just see a scene and I'll start a book and sometimes it can be the middle, sometimes it could be just the opening if I'm lucky. But um, yeah, I don't know, I, I think it's because when I come to um, a problem <laughs> in the plot, in, I don't like to really face it just then, I always think it's gonna fix itself so I'll go to a different part of the story. But I should know by now after whatever it is, 15 books, that that 
problem at the beginning is still going to be there. So yeah, I'm glad no one can see me at the end of it because I'm usually sitting there pulling my hair out, wondering how to mesh it all together, you know, all the bits and pieces. But eventually it happens. I'm sure there would be an easier way. <laughs> I just never seem to learn. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so how long do you generally find that it takes for you to, to get down that first draft, Carly? Uh, again, it depends on the storyline. Um, there's been a time where not very often that you get, I get the whole, um, pretty much the whole plot sort of, and I just rush it down. And I think I probably did that one with um, If Wishes Were Horses, but that was, and that was probably my fun. That's true. in gaps and things it was sort of that was probably the closest I've ever come to writing from beginning to end um but yeah um mostly it's probably about a seven month sort of turnaround to get it all down if you I do tend to write a couple at a time so I'm sort of back and forwards it's not always sitting on one story for that time but that's usually how long it takes by the time you get back to it and finish it and how do you go um, putting down one manuscript to then start the editing on the, the next book? Because I know in my head, I'll start going, oh, yes, da, 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 that character. Yeah. Like, oh, no, nope, wrong book. That's not yeah. that character. <laughs> uh, it's like kids calling their names. <laughs> Who are you? Which one are you? Come here. But, um, yeah, after a little while, you do try to sort them out. But, yeah, it does still happen. But it's not a, not a daily thing. I'm not doing two or three books a day. It's usually just concentrating on one at a time. But, yeah, it can be a little bit tricky. It's actually yeah. more tricky talking about them because sometimes I'm focusing on the book I'm writing now and not the one that's already out. So yeah. that's really <laughs> tricky. <laughs> um, and so you touched on the fact that this is um, 10 years published with Alan Unlin. It's your 15th published novel. That's epic. Did you think that when you started um, writing that you would be at this stage? No, I keep thinking that they're going to look down and say, oh, that wasn't the book we actually thought it was. <laughs> well, <laughs> the beginning, but it's too late now because I'm here. So, um, yeah, no, I, I really didn't know. I, what, all I was focused on at the very beginning was um, getting a book in front of a publisher. And once I did that, I had no idea what came after that. I had no idea what the <laughs> process was. I didn't, I didn't even think ahead that far. And so, um, yeah, 10 years down the track seems to have, just happened and I'm very, very lucky. And we have lovely publishers. So yeah, I live in the dream at the moment. It's beautiful. Oh, that's fantastic. So you and I are lucky enough to share the very lovely Annette Barlow mm -hmm. um, as our publisher. And one of the things that really impresses me is the way that a publisher can look at the whole big picture of the story. I'll send through this manuscript that I know has got holes in it. And you know, there's a few things that aren't quite right, but you can't see it. Does it amaze you as well, the way that they can go, ah, oh, yes, that thread goes in here and that ties in there and I can see what you're trying to do, but we just need to move this or that. It's pretty good, isn't it? It is impressive. And I love how they can tell you that you're being an absolute idiot without making you sound like you're an absolute <laughs> idiot. They've got very, very interesting ways of um, coaxing you in the right direction. Yeah, no, they're very okay. clever. It's excellent. Do you have a favourite part of the, the process? Is it the first draft that you like best, Carly, or is it um, going through that editing process and the polishing? What's your favourite bit of writing a book? Um, I'd have to say it is the editorial review stage, like that first one you get back where they've, they pull everything to pieces. Sometimes that can be really frustrating if it's really, really bad. But um, I really do like that... Sometimes you need that little direction. I think if you haven't really got um, a network behind you, like um, someone to brainstorm with when you're writing, I don't tend to. I Sometimes I can. I can find, you know, a few willing people to sit and brainstorm certain sections. But I find that's when you've been given, like, someone else's opinion as it's as it's sort of they've gone through it. And that's where you can look and say, oh, that's that's interesting. I didn't think of that. And either go that way or a new idea of your own sparks but yeah it still sends it into a different direction it's, I think that bit is probably my favorite although when it comes when you're right in the middle of another book it's really frustrating because you've got to put it all down again but um yeah I quite enjoy that bit yeah excellent um and after you've finished writing your first draft um I think Stephen King in his book on writing talked about just 
putting it in a cupboard and leaving it for as long as you possibly can, whether it's two weeks or whether it's two months, you know, to let it ferment in your brain. Do you do that or because you're writing two books a year, is it, um, you know, you have to kind of go straight into the next one? Yeah. Um, occasionally I do leave it sitting there for a bit and then when it comes closer to I need to get it in, I do go back and panic <laughs> and rewrite it all again or something. But, um, yeah, it is a bit of a... Um, you're on a bit of a time frame sort of thing, but it is good to step away from it. I think I do that probably through the whole process too, which probably means I don't really need to leave it as long at the end because I think when you step away to try, you know, to do your other books, you're naturally sort of letting it ferment in the back of your mind. When you do go back, it's sort of sometimes you can see things a little bit different as you're going. So I tend to do it sort of on the go. Yeah. Mm. And do you have beta readers that you um, give your book to before you send it to um, Annette or do you, um, or does it go straight through, straight to the keeper? Yeah. Sometimes I will give it to a couple of close friends or daughters if they're, <laughs> look like they're doing nothing. Um, here, do this, take this book, do something to do. And I just, I like to get people to probably to read through to see if it's flowing properly like that's my biggest thing because when you do chop and change so much and go back and rewrite sometimes you're not sure if it's still making sense so I tend to at least get someone to read through it that hasn't read it before so that yeah I don't look too stupid when it gets it <laughs> <laughs> well I think it all comes together beautifully and it flows really well and, and I think that the pages just turn so quickly which Good. is all Thank you. Right. Yeah. Um, and so I stole this question from Candace Fox and she writes fantastic thrillers. She's an Aussie author. Mm -hmm. I think you like Candace as well. I right? do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. She's lovely. Yeah. I've, um, I met her in author talk in uh, our local library, but then I've also listened to a few podcasts and she said one of her favorite things is to ask people, what's the strangest thing that's happened to you during your career? So Carly Lane, tell me when you're, <laughs> whether it's in your research process or whether you're writing the book or out on book tour, have you had any strange things that you can think of? Um, well, I don't know about, well, odd things with um, the way things fall into place sometimes with um, Poppy's Dilemma, that was a book that was set or based on a local story around here where I live. And that was sort of a really strange one to write because so many things just seemed to keep falling into place with this character who was based on a real life character. And um, yeah, and he was a World War I um, veteran who I eventually, as I was writing and researching, ended up finding his actual real letters that he wrote from the war. Um, somebody had found them in a secondhand shop years later and I tracked this fellow down he sent me his letters so as I was writing the book it was really just amazing that I had these actual letters written in the same tone that they used in that sort of era um, it was just really lovely and things just kept sort of falling into place with that book it was just um, it was a very special one to write yeah that's perfect I got all shivers down my spine thinking yeah. about finding those letters that's just very serendipitous yeah. <laughs> very, yeah, very amazing. <laughs> oh, excellent. Um, and so getting right back to when it all started, what made you decide to try and become a published author? Had you been writing on and off for quite some time and, and always thought about it? Or had you uh, decided, you know, birthday resolution, right, this year I'm going to write a book? <laughs> <laughs> um, I had been writing on and off probably since I was about, um, about 19. I was pretty young getting married and we moved to a different town. Actually the biggest town was that I'd been living in till then was um, Newcastle. So I didn't really know anybody and I tended to read a lot. And then I ran out of the type of books I was really enjoying. The military suspense type um, book was what I was reading then. And then I was getting cranky because the books that I really liked um, were usually written by men and I loved it. <laughs> But I used to skip past the 50 odd pages of descriptive writing about the gun and the, the tank or whatever they were talking about just to get back to the actual storyline. And then I used to get cranky because if there was a romance in it, the woman would end up being killed and then that would just fire the guy up so that he'd have to go on his little revenge thing. And it used to annoy me. I used to think, why can't she live? Like, she can do something <laughs> useful. And so I decided to write my own. Um, and just develop characters that were, um, I think that's probably where my characters started. They're two um, 
well, the original character, she wasn't like a Rambo character, but she fell into this situation and had to more or less, you know, learn on the run and yeah, realised she was useful, didn't have to be killed, <laughs> didn't have to be used as the, the you know, heroes thing. But um, so I started writing because of that, I think. Um, and it still took a lot of on and off time between kids and moving and life, but um, picked it up then probably, it was about 12 years before that book got published and finished and yeah, I could start writing properly then. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and then I loved when I, re the acknowledgement section of a book is one of my new favourite things to read in a book. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed the story that I love going to the acknowledgements and just seeing the little threads that come for the inspiration and um, why different parts were important to different people. And I loved knowing that um, the story of this trying to buy back the family farm was a bit rooted in true story in your own history. Can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, I am. Um, well, my grandparents had a farm not far from where I am now, actually. And um, that was just, it was sort of our home because my family moved around quite a lot. Um, my dad was in the bank, so we moved quite often. And the farm was sort of always home. Like we always came back there at Christmas and holidays. And that was a lot of where we, we sort of, was a constant um, and when they got older and it got too much for them they decided to sell it and I can just remember how devastating that was like you know it was sort of like losing something really important but at the time I wasn't in a position to do anything about it and so yeah I just I guess in the back of my mind I'd always thought one day I'm going to buy that back and it'd be so lovely to have that family connection again with it and all that sort of thing but um yeah it came up again not long ago um but we'd already bought our other place and it was just a, again you know miss the boat type thing but i still yeah i still in the back of my mind would love to do that one day i don't think it'll ever happen but um just i guess in hindsight you sort of go back and when you go back it's not the same it's not like nana and pop were there and i think that's where a lot of that um wishful thinking comes from i think you sort of you see it how it was and how you remember it but when you see it now after it's been a long time in other people's hands and it's just not the same and I think that's sort of more what was driving it for me but um, I still wouldn't say no if I, I had the opportunity I guess <laughs> but, yeah, and it sort of came from that I think I um, yeah I just figured it'd be nice to live that out in a character's life so that they actually had a happy ending it would have been good yeah, and I think that's one of the really cool things about being an author is that you can create those happy endings. So mm. exactly how you'd like it to go. Exactly, yeah. It's a bit yeah. frustrating when you can't do that in real life. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, Carly, do you do anything special with your advances? I know there's some authors that buy themselves a particular piece of jewellery every time they mm. have a book out. Um, is there anything interesting that you do with yours or does it just go into the Guy Fawkes Heritage Horses Fund? <laughs> <laughs> my horses eat my money. <laughs> I was only saying to my daughter as they were, we were watching the horses eat some hay yesterday. I might as well just give them money to eat. That's just what it feels like watching them eat. But um, uh, yeah, no, my money funds my horse addiction, basically. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you've got a uh, particular passion about the Guy Fawkes Heritage Horses, which some people mistakenly call Brumbies. And I hadn't realised until we did our interview on the blog, uh, Kiss and Tell with May Ellenell, that, that Brumbies was the wrong name for these Guy Fawkes Heritage Horses. Well, yeah, but I do still love the Brumby term. I still use it and get in trouble all the time. But <laughs> it's sort of now, it's more for their protection that they've been given the Heritage Horse um, breed title so that they're a registered breed in their own right and it's more to protect them now instead of being just feral pests they've sort of been given some kind of a little bit of safety but um yeah it's a very uh i started writing about them in wishes were horses um completely fell into it um and then went up to visit the guy Fawkes place afterwards because it's not far it's up just up the mountain for me um, and came away from that with two horses. <laughs> just went up for a look. Um, and then, yeah, added to it after that. But they are just amazing, amazing animals. And the, the, the association itself is just, they do so much work. And it's just so good that you can rehome things that would normally just be put down and, and eradicated. But these 
they're just amazing. You, I look at mine and just think I can't even imagine life without them. So it's just such an important thing that they're doing. And my next book actually features them, the one that's coming out in December. So yes, everyone that's sick of me talking about them has to endure it for one more book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure people love reading about it. It's nice to um, see you being able to talk about something you're really passionate about. It's mm, yeah. I know I had to trim a lot. <laughs> saying, I don't know if we need to know this much. So that's a little bit awkward, but um, okay. <laughs> um, now, what do your family think about you being an author? Do they think my mum's pretty famous and they see you in the newspaper, they hear you on the radio and on different podcasts? Or, you know, 10 years in, are they a bit more blase about it? And uh, that's just what mum does. Um, yes. Probably that. <laughs> it doesn't seem to hold much weight when I'm telling them what to do and what they should be doing. You know who I am. <laughs> I can't even use that with them. They don't care. But um, I think they're, they're pretty proud and that's lovely. But um, yeah, and it's, it's pretty cool. Oh, excellent. Mm. Um, going down to career highlights, um, is there, a, can you pick a favourite book? Can you pick a favourite thing about um, your running career so far, Carly? Oh, it's just all been one big thing, really. It still feels like a, a bit of a dream and I still see my books on the shelf and think, I just can't even believe that's my book sitting right up there. <laughs> I like to go and put them next to someone really famous and just think, oh, <laughs> I'm rubbing shoulders with whoever. <laughs> it feels really cool. But um, probably, I think the biggest thing, I, the biggest kick I got was earlier on, one of the earlier ones. I used to, um, when we lived at Townsville, I used to order the, uh, I don't know what they were now, um, the online books from Double Day. Double Day Books used to send you a catalogue and you used to be able to buy them like that. And that's how we used to get them. And I used to go through and pick off all my books I wanted and get them sent to me. And then the first time I saw a catalogue with one of my books in it was a pretty, uh, I had, it was a real moment. I just thought, oh my God, all those years I was, you know, reading, reading, reading and buying all these books. And then there's this catalogue with my book in it. So that was pretty cool. I think that really drove it home the most, I think, that that point. That's pretty special, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so do you like to, when you're reading, do you like the e-books, the audio books or a paperback? I know there's some people that are pretty divided. <laughs> yeah, I really was always print. Then um, early on when the ebooks did come out, I found it was a really good way of getting just so much more variety and so many more, like it kind of blew my mind a little bit for a very little while. Um, that was really good. And because I'm impatient in nature, it was really great because if I wanted a book, I could get it then instead of having to wait to go into town or, you know, put it on your list. Um, and recently, since we've got audio done, I have started listening on audio too, which is something that I hadn't really done before. And that kind of has its own place too. I, I've listened to one doing a drive up to Guy Fawkes and that usually it's only not that long a trip, but I can remember having this on and sort of next minute I'm there and I thought, oh, where did that time go sort of thing. So really good for traveling and things like that. So I think each of them have their own place and I think I spread it out amongst all of them. I have a bit of everything. Yeah, that's great. I'm finding, I love a good audio book and Normally I'd listen to, I'd have one on the go and then sometimes if I'm reading a book and it's, um, you know, I'm, I'm loving it, then I'll listen to the audio as well and then pick it up, you know, at night. Um, <laughs> with COVID at the moment, I'm finding I'm not getting through half of my amount of um, listening because I'm not driving anywhere. Yeah, yes, I know. It's a, it's a bit inconvenient really, isn't it? <laughs> it is. And the children are at home all the time, so I can't just go and spend hours in the garden with an audio book. <laughs> I'm tempted to leave my don't come in unless someone's bleeding sign up just so that I could just get some writing, uh, reading done and not writing. So. Yeah. yeah, I know. Um, in your spare time, besides horses, I see you are trying pottery. Is that right? Oh, God, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I decided to do a three-week pottery thing through TAFE at the beginning, just before all this started. We did three Saturdays and just loved it. Really good. Can't do it. I'm absolutely <laughs> You can see it looks like a two-year-old and trying to make a cup. But I am determined I am going to keep doing this. And, um, yeah, my kids decided to buy me a pottery wheel for Mother's Day. Never used one in my life. We already had a three-week course, so we were still only doing hand stuff. But um, yes, took that for a spin on the weekend for the first time and yeah, still suck at it, but we're going to keep trying. 
So is there going to be any themes of Demi Moore, like with the pottery wheel and Patrick Swayze, your husband's going to help you with the, the pottery? Yeah, yeah, probably not. I think I made a mess of it enough myself. I can't imagine that. And the clean up, oh my God. I sat there looking at all the mess and it takes me about three hours to clean it all up. Like, I don't think that would really, I don't think that would be sexy. I don't know how they made that sexy in that movie, quite frankly, because <laughs> reality is so different. <laughs> Well, you know what, if you make it uh, big in the pottery world, then I can sit there drinking a car from a Carly Lane mug while I'm reading yes. a Carly Lane book. That'd be very convenient. It Maybe would be. Fun. I don't know if you'd actually be able to hold anything in the Carly Lane mug. <laughs> it's probably got, they're not that good. <laughs> <laughs> Give it a year. I'm sure you'll be fine. <laughs> yes, or two. Yes. Uh, now, before we go to Rita's question, it's, I'd love to ask you, um, where can people buy your book, Carly? Where do people find Fool Me Once? Uh, all the department stores and our lovely bookstores, a lot of the um, private loaned, uh, what do you call it, independent bookstores around are doing lots of post out stuff. So support local where you can and online if you can't find one or you don't have one. So that's been really good. Should be available everywhere. Excellent. And can people get it in ebook and audio as well? Yep, I think it's, I'm pretty sure it's available in audio. Most of them still go all out at the same time, but I haven't actually seen it yet, but I'm sure it is. But yes, they should be available, ebook, audio and print. Excellent. And one last question before we go to the main questions is, where can people find you online, Carly? Do you have a newsletter, a blog, you've got a website, um, Instagram, Facebook, where should we find you? You'll usually find me on Facebook, probably a little bit too much, and you'll probably find a little <laughs> bit too much information on Facebook. Um, I do have a website, uh, but I forget to update that sometimes and I'm a bit naughty. So, um, yes, probably Facebook's the place to see me. Yes. Excellent. Beautiful. Marnie, have we got any questions from um, people? We do. There's actually been a little bit of chatter about BNS balls in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> So Annette and Leonie, um, well, Annette was saying that she um, thought it was interesting to hear that Carly says that she likes to make her characters feel uncomfortable. And Leonie was saying, well, yes, as much as BNS balls are fun, there is that uncomfortable bit at the start. <laughs> <laughs> but Annette wanted to know if either of you have ever been to a BNS ball. <laughs> you go first, Carly. I sadly haven't. I was married so young I, I didn't get to do any of the fun stuff <laughs> I'm really regretting it now maybe I'll go and relive it now but I think they're a little bit too rowdy for me now I'd be the old mother hen going around saying don't do that don't do that maybe we but, can all go together yeah that'd be interesting <laughs> Um, I haven't been to a BNS ball, but um, I have been to the Daniloquin Ute Muster, and I think that's pretty much as close as you can get to a BNS mm -hmm. um, and also, I met my husband at a singles ball, which was, I like to describe it as classier than a BNS because there's a <laughs> few dye getting thrown around. Um, and so it was called Butte Blokes, and it was specifically for the country boys to meet girls from out of the region. And so I went along, and it was that awkward moment of walking into the room. Um, and, you know, we were a day late, so it was a whole weekend thing. And walked into the room and there's all these people looking at us and you kind of feel a little bit like a you know cow being walked around the cattle <laughs> <laughs> but no there was um, no food diet it was very very nice no vomit <laughs> no vomit no awesome <laughs> that is classy then <laughs> i feel a little bit better knowing i've been to a couple of denny ute musters so for me i'm like oh so the mud and yeah okay um I, I did have a man come up to me and offer me a full strength beer out of his driver bone <laughs> um, while keith urban was on stage so yeah there's everyone's got a story <laughs> Um, now Anna was wondering she'd like to know from both of you how you got your publishing deals with Alan and Unwin very great. You go, Carly. <laughs> um, I, I submitted a book to the Friday Pitch. Um, yeah, it wasn't sure. I didn't know it was actually rural and I didn't know rural fiction was a thing till then. So luckily that's what was being looked for and mine fitted that. Yeah, so it was a really, it was quite lucky actually. Excellent. Well, I'm going to fall into that lucky camp as well because I was planning on pitching to um, Annette at the Romance Writers Conference um, last year, the year before, in 2018. 
And so I thought I'd do what all good stalkers do and um, <laughs> find her on social media. And I was very, very pleased to see that um, we had a lot in common. We both like baking and gardening and pets. And she noticed that I was writing rural romance because I you know, had mentioned that quite a few times that being my author profile. And uh, so we made a connection that way and sent through the manuscript and uh, very, very lucky it was what um, she was after. See, it's yeah. fine to stalk. <laughs> <laughs> now tell me both of you, what was the, or Kate has asked, what was the very first book you wrote? Hmm. Uh, well, mine actually started off as a shark story. <laughs> I, don't know why. I do not know why. And it didn't go very long. I thought I'd finished my book. It was like three pages, fool's cap pages. So I was pretty stoked. But then I went on to my military stuff. So I guess my first proper one was my operation series that I started writing. Uh, my official one was Wildfire Ridge, which um, came out last year. And before that, though, I'd always been writing. So... I've had some friends pull out some things from, you know, when they are moving house, they found these little things from um, back when I was a nanny in America. I wrote a story about some um, football guy to show the American kids about the footballer. And so I went to their schools and gave a little read along of the story that I'd written for them and they left it. And after 20 years, they're just moving house now. And um, one of the boys sent me a photo. I said, do you remember this? Oh, no. I remember that. <laughs> and then a friend from primary school who now lives up in Queensland um, was going through some stuff of hers. And she found a book that I'd written back when I was maybe 10 and it had my name on it. And I had my publishing company, Mail and Earl Publishing. So... <laughs> That is gorgeous. <laughs> now, Annette has asked, um, can you tell us any of the authors whose books you will always read as soon as they come out? Oh, that's a good one. Well, I like Mayers now. I'm actually going to be reading them from now on because I started reading her book last night and, yeah, it's just great. Love it. We've got a new fan. <laughs> um, other than that, I'm really still hooked on my Outlander stuff that I started 20 years ago, but I've got to say, for anyone who says, I can't wait for your new book when I get give them two books a year and I'm still waiting on that woman to write the next book that's taken, I don't know, three or four years, I want you all to pay attention. <laughs> it's <very> frustrating. <laughs> Oh, nice. Well, I love our rural romance authors. So um, Fleur's books, Fleur MacDonald and Carly's books are always great. I love Fiona Lowe. Um, her books just really um, float my boat. She uh, writes great commercial fiction, women's fiction, family sagas. Um, Natasha Lester, I love her historical stuff. So her newest one came out and I was just captivated the Paris secret. So yeah, I like to read lots of different uh, authors. I also love the library because um, they're just wonderful libraries and I can't get enough of them. It's a bit tricky at the moment with a lot of them being closed, but um, I think that's great because that can kind of feed my addiction without having to buy quite so many books. I would, I would actually have to agree with you at the moment. And I have to say both your books are available on our library apps at the moment. So we have three apps, BorrowBox, RB Digital and Cloud Library. And your books are accessible in ebook and e audiobook on those apps with your Franklin City Libraries membership. Um, now, we do have a question from Anna for Carly. Uh, where does the name Guy Fawkes Heritage Horses come from? She's struggling to make the connection with Guy Fawkes and gunpowder plotters of 15th and early mm. 16th century. Because if you mess with our horses, we'll blow you up. <laughs> no, it's not, it's not really. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, Guy Fawkes National Park is the national park that's at Ebor, and that's where these horses are and have been for hundreds of years. So um, they just take it from that Guy Fawkes Heritage Horses and heritage being that they have the genetic um, DNA from our first um, lot of horses that were taken over to war from um, India and World War One, and that's where they've sort of sourced these horses from, and they're still the original stock. Cool. Um, now, I do have a lovely comment. Kate has said, us kids are proud of mum. We just have to oh, keep her grounded. They <laughs> do that very well. <laughs> Thank you, Caitlin. <laughs> I think we've answered this question from Lynn, but she did have a question of what books do you read just for fun? Um, and I think you've both answered that your favourite genre would be rural romance and yourself, military and Outlander, that kind of... Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And Leonie just commented that she snorted, she snorted her coffee at Carly's I don't know how they made that look sexy in the movie comment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Leonie has not seen ghosts. <gasps> you really need to do that. We know exactly what Leonie's doing this weekend. We do. <laughs> yeah. That is not me on the pottery wheel, by the way. <laughs> yeah, she said, I think it's now spoiled for me. No, Leonie, that's the first 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you have to watch it this weekend. Um, oh, <laughs> Annette has also said Carly Lane mug sounds like a great idea for marketing. And I tell you what, I would have one on my desk. Okay, I'm going to send you one. <laughs> I'm going to so regret that. <laughs> I think you're at my level of pottery, to be honest. Yeah. I um, don't know. Does it look like a two-year-old made it? Because well, I almost bought a home, like, learn to do it kind of kit and didn't. So that's the level I'm at. <laughs> I'm hearing you. We're good. We're good. Um, okay, so Rebecca has asked, how do you capture the feel of the New England landscape? What, uh, what makes this setting different to other regions? Um, I love that area. We have, we go up there quite a lot. Uh, my husband's family are up there. We used to live at Tamworth. So we used to travel back and forwards through there from childhood basically. So I've always loved it up there and it's it's nice just to sort of mix up your settings, I think, but it actually was probably um, the ideal setting for a lot of the times, that one, and especially the next one where the horses are set. So it's kind of, I don't know, I just I tend to fall back onto that one quite often. I don't know why, it just has something. And you were over in Scotland, weren't you, Carly, just recently? <sighs> Have you got any plans to set some overseas books? I have finished my overseas Scotland book, which Annette will be happy to hear, but <laughs> it's going through a read through now. But uh, yeah, loved it. Just love Scotland. And, and it's very much like that New England sort of feel and area. So um, yeah, yeah, really loved it. I have to ask which season were you in Scotland for? Um, we went over end of September and beginning of October. So That's when I was there. Oh, really? We could have not, not recently. I was there about 10 years ago. But oh, God, right, right. I can fully appreciate the landscape at that time of year in Scotland. It is breathtaking. Just, and just so rural. I was so surprised that so much um, farming was done. It's just everywhere, which was great. I sort of felt like I was home. It was lovely. Absolutely. Now, Lou would like to know if you found it more difficult to write your first or second book. And what advice would you give to help you focus on writing when you're waiting to hear from your editor or publisher, mm -hmm. et cetera? Um, how are you, mm -hmm. and it's a three part <laughs> question. Um, how are you keeping focus with so many COVID related distractions? Baking, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> I only attempt to bake, so <laughs> mine's all right. I lock myself in the room and threaten anyone who comes in. But um, no, it's only been lately that we've actually got into some kind of routine. Before that, it was all pretty up in the air. But um, it isn't actually much different, except that the kids are home for me. And yeah, I'm usually just stuck at home and quite like it. Yeah. Um, and which, which, was, um, which book did you find uh, most difficult to write, your first or second? Well, both of them, I'd sort of written my first and second before I'd actually got published for the first. So I don't really know. I think it's, um, well, the first one was quite difficult because I had to actually go back and take out one whole point of view, like the male point of view. So I had to do a big rewrite to start with. And that was quite challenging when I had no idea what I was doing anyway. But um, so that was probably my biggest learning curve with the book. Um, but... Yeah, I don't know, unless down the track it's when you've got pressure to write one that you need a deadline for. I don't do deadlines real well, so that's why I try to keep ahead. <laughs> but, um, yeah, probably the first one, really, I guess, because you're sort of still learning and you're trying to figure out how to put it all together. How about yourself, Maya? Um, so I think I found the first one easier in that um, I had that story in my head for, for a little bit longer. and. Um, with the second one, because Wildflower Ridge had done so well, um, I was worried that I was trying to write another Wildflower Ridge in a way. I thought, 
but, but they're not going to get that exact same story. Well, of course they can't because you can't write the same book twice. So it's, it would never make sense, but there's still that worry in your mind, of course, that, oh, it's, it's actually done okay. It's um, people, people are buying it and seem to like it. What if they don't like the second one? So I guess you've got that fear in your head. And, you know, does that go away after 10 years, do you find, Carly? <laughs> <laughs> they like the first one. What if they don't buy the 15th one? <laughs> it's not, no, it's always there, I think, that bit. Yeah, it's a, I don't know. It, it's because I think you have it in your head and you're writing it and you're spending so much time with it, but you're just never quite sure what, yeah, I don't know. I, no, it doesn't go away. Yeah. Um, and so in terms of routine for me, um, because I've got the kids home and normally um, they're all at the dining table with me and, and I'll have my laptop set up, but I've put my desktop down now because it's just too tricky because the kids need my laptop and then their school laptops. And yeah, so it's been a bit chaotic, the whole COVID thing in terms of productivity, but um, I guess I've gotten around it by getting up really early to write. So that's uh, the only way that I've been able to do it because when they're sitting around the table and someone wants to know how to do long division, I think, oh, I'm not really mm. that quite sure how to do all those little technical processes anymore. I've got a calculator. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, for me, it's been a little bit trickier trying to get things done. But, I mean, I, can, I find that I can reply to emails and I can update mm. my website and stuff like that while they're around. I just can't come up with a scene from scratch. That's yeah. a little bit trickier. Yeah. It is hard. I had a shop open until we went to Scotland last the end of last year. And I thought I had all these visions of being able to write because, you know, it's unbearable. It's not going to be busy, busy. But I just found I didn't write anything in that time. It was really hard. And I was starting to really get stressed about it because it just, I just need my space, I think, and not with the noise and everything going on around. I shared it with a cafe, I suppose. It didn't help. But yeah, I, I really was surprised at how that little bit of a different environment actually had such a huge effect. Yeah, and, and I forgot to ask you about your writing space, Carly. You've got a perfectly good office, haven't you? Uh, yes. <laughs> you. I used to have a perfectly good office till my shop contents filled it and I can't even get there anymore. <laughs> it's a bit awkward. Um, so now I've commandeered my daughter's room she moved out of and um, yeah, and but I tend to write just on my lounge where I can see the horses. <laughs> <laughs> now we've got a question from Lynn who would like to know the name of your most loved children's book like if you had to name one what would it be I love Enid Blight and I love the faraway trees and all those sort of fairy things I'm always I don't think I've ever got over my fairy addiction and, <laughs> and that sort of thing yeah um for me once one of my favourite ones that I love to read to the kids when they were younger was Where the Wild Things Are. That was just one of my favourite books to read them. Um, and then uh, Anne of Green Gables. I feel like I just could read that, you know, another four times and I wouldn't be unhappy because it's just such a lovely story. And the endearing messages, it's just, um, it's so lovely. So. It's lovely. Um, now, Lou's just asking, how strong is the market for Australian rural romance overseas? <clears throat> Not very strong, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I would love, and it's going to hate this. I hope she's not still here. Um, my, my goal, my yes. aim in life is to get into the UK. So I hound her about that all the time and she's really sick of me doing it. But um, yeah, apparently not very strong. So, oh shit, she's, I mean, well, she's still here. <laughs> I saw her pop up on the bottom. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know. And I honestly don't know why that would be because, um, I don't know, I, we love reading English American stuff and I can't imagine that it's that different for them. I think, you know, if you're writing in the same sort of um, genres that they like to read over there, I think it's something that they would pick up if they had the opportunity, probably. So, mm. but um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, and it might just be opportunity more than anything. Yeah, I think the right timing. I think the same thing. Um, obviously, I've only got one book out and one on the way, but uh, you know, I like to read widely. I love you know picking up a book that's set um, in a different spot every now and then. So, yeah. Mm. Maybe, maybe that's something we can work on, Carly. We can be a campaign. Let's do it together. Let's drive her crazy together. <laughs> I sent her emails last week, so you do it this week. 
All right, excellent. Okay. Okay. No worries. You got, you got some set, set calendar reminders. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm just having a giggle because Kate sent us another message. Oh saying, my God, <laughs> Caitlin. <laughs> yes, yeah, she does threaten the kids, the cats and the dogs to not bug her while she's riding unless we're bleeding. <laughs> um, uh, you're in trouble. How do you keep finding inspiration to come up with ideas for two novels a year, Carly? Well, I tend to work, like I said, a couple ahead. So it's sort of not, I'm not as clever as it sounds. <laughs> I don't sort of slave over one and then sort of have it out at that time. So I'm just constantly writing. I think it's just something that I do. If I'm stuck on something, I'll start another one. If I need some spark of inspiration, I'll probably start a whole new book just to um, just to get some ideas on, on another one. And then I'd go back to them. I find it's a lot easier to go back to something that's already started instead of like a blank screen that's that's never fun mm. so um yeah as long as i yeah it's not i just keep writing them i don't know <laughs> <laughs> um there's a little bit of discussion about rural romance australian rural romance overseas um and rebecca Ooh. said she's heard that it's quite popular in the scandy country there you go in it yeah, and Lou was just saying um, that it's interesting because Australian crime is really, really popular overseas. So maybe the trend will move towards Australian rural romance. Maybe we can start murdering people in our book. Look, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. Just kill off a few characters, a um, bit of mystery around it. <laughs> I'm onto it. I reckon I can weave that into a few I've got ready to go. So, yep. Okay. Sounds good to us. Yep. Um, I think that's all we've got in the chat. Oh, no, hang on. I was about to say we're, we're right. We're, that's all we've got. Um, so uh, what have we got here? Okay, so plotters or pantsers, we, we did discuss that a bit earlier. Um, or how or where do you develop ideas? In the shower, while you're asleep? How you will. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, mine... Um, sometimes, yeah, I don't know, really, they just sort of happen. They're sometimes in the bath, you come up with a good idea or a solution, but yeah, usually they just spring up in the middle of a conversation or something. That's what makes writers a bit strange. <laughs> How about yourself, Maya? Um, I'll find a lot of my inspiration um, reading the newspaper or reading magazines. So um, pretty much any time I pick up a copy of the, um, the Weekly Times or the Stock Journal, There'll be something in there about someone starting a chicken farm and how that's gone well for them and the pitfalls they've had or someone who's, you know, looking to do a niche alpaca business. I go, oh, excellent. You know, book four, I think it's going to involve a chicken farm or a dahlia farm. So um, different things like that will pop up into my brain. But I'll also find that I'll be sitting at the swimming pool watching my kids' lessons but also looking at the chap next to me who's got really hairy ears and I'm thinking <laughs> yeah you're right I could make you know the father-in-law in that book He's, he might have some pretty wiry hairs coming out of his ears like so little <laughs> things like that will just kind of pop into my brain every now and then um, and then you know even just general conversations I'll um file away little snippets like Carly was saying you just kind of hear something and it you know just really gets mm. there Hmm. And how do you then both work to then develop those ideas? So when those initial inspiration comes, do you then have that time to sit down and really develop that plot? Or is it something that you'll go, yep, that's really great. And then something else will come along and a character development will happen and you'll quickly jot that down. Or how do you, how do you then develop those ideas? Um, if it's something completely different, I'll probably start writing that book, but probably with that scene. Sometimes I just have a scene. Sorry, Maya. It could be, it could be. She's got that twitchy look about us again. Yeah. But um, yeah, I often if it's yeah, or it could be just that it stays in the back of your mind and you work it into something maybe down the track in the plot that you've got because I don't plot, so I can put whatever I want in there. I must, I must, I'm absolutely loving this conversation with you, Carly, because you are the first person I've come across who writes in a similar fashion to me. So, completely and, disorganized. Yes, it's like I've written my last chapter and chapter three and maybe chapter thirty, and, and I know that at some point I'll write the tiny little in betweens to make them all link together. That's just at the end. You don't worry about that. Just yeah. finish it. Yeah. <laughs> You'll be right. We are the ultimate pantsers, really. Oh, I don't think even we wear pants. I don't think we're even like pants. Oh, well, I am sitting down. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> now, Maya, Maya, how about 
yourself? How do you look at developing those ideas and those characters? So I have got a notebook, which is just out of reach. Um, I considered getting off my little stool and coming back, but then I might not be in the right spot. So I won't do that. <laughs> uh, so I've got a notebook that I feel with all these different ideas. So they've got random different things. So I'll think, okay, um, chicken farm, maybe, you know, they build it out of the wrong material, the portable tractors that go around the paddock. So I'll just, you know, write some little notes to myself about that. And then I'll think, okay, then I was speaking to someone um, about a funeral and, she was saying how it's just, you know, if you had to go to a funeral, this was a lovely one to go to. And I thought, you know what? We might need to kill off someone in book four. <laughs> we might have a funeral there and it might be one of those really nice funerals that, um, you know, <laughs> go as, as nice as can be planned. So that was a conversation that I had with someone a year and a half ago. But I've kind of filed that away. I, I wasn't ready to kill anyone off in book three, but, you know, book four, four oh, watch out. <laughs> <laughs> So I just filed them away in my little notebook um, and, and hopefully I can draw them all together. And, and sometimes I have little plot ideas that I really want to put in, I really want to put in and they'll kind of come through in, in book two. I started writing a little subplot and you know, I edited that out. And then book three, I've kind of put that little subplot back in, you know, different character but similar issues. Um, you know, so I think if it's something that keeps popping up, you know it's something that you've got a bit of an affinity with that you need to put in there. So mm. for me, mm. they, they kind of, the different ideas just hit me. <laughs> <laughs> and I was going to ask Carly, another question that I forgot to ask you is, I know we've got a few um, aspiring writers, hi Lou, um, in here. Can you give some advice? What's your tip when people ask you at your book tours? Mm. I'm an aspiring writer, what can I do? What do you normally say, Carly? I always still feel like, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know, I don't even know what I do. But I think the biggest thing I got out of it was you just, you write and then you just write some more and you keep writing and that then you can go back to that first one. But um, I think, yeah, you just, you don't sort of realise how much that writing muscle sort of develops because you can write something and then come back to it a little while later and read it and just think, what was I thinking? That sounds so crap. <laughs> And then rewrite it and you just think, oh, well, now I must be writing a little bit different or a little bit better or something. So I think do that as much as you can. Write three or four books before you want to submit one and then go back and then sort of, you sort of work your way up and join places like Romance Writers of Australia. That's sort of where I finally found my, my people. Um, up until that point, really, oh, even just before that, I didn't have internet for a long time. So I was just floundering around and doing whatever I thought was how you do it. And it wasn't until um, I had started to decide to do it properly, had the internet connected with this group and went to a conference and everything just sort of seemed to fall into place. You find it doesn't even really matter if you don't write romance as such. It's just that you find these people that like writing and do things that you do that maybe you don't have a lot of other people around you that do the same sort of things. So very important for um, kicking off your enthusiasm and getting you all excited about stuff and networking and learning about stuff. So that's probably where mine took off from. And yeah, I'd suggest that's what they do. Yeah, I fully agree with that too. I've, um, I wouldn't be the published author that I am today if I hadn't joined Romance Writers. And, and when I was writing, I wasn't sure whether what I was writing was rural romance or whether it was rural fiction or oh, whether it was women's fiction, I wasn't quite sure. But once you join a group like that, I found that, you know, they'll help you along and the different competitions that you can enter are just mm. valuable for the different feedback that you can get on your writing. And it's not just your mum, who is lovely. I know mum's watching today. Hi, mum. <laughs> She's in South Australia, so I can't hug her. I can't even go visit her. Um, so that's a bit sad. But, you know, I think if you can send it to someone who's completely impartial, that's a huge bonus. Mm. And to your mum, because then you just need them to say it's great anyway. Definitely. <laughs> we, we did actually have a question earlier um, about whether or not you let your mums read your sex scenes. <laughs> <laughs> I tell mine which pages to skip usually. <laughs> but then I think that's probably the first page they all go back to. My dad probably goes straight to that part anyway. But um, I actually find, in, especially in the early days, I think they were that little thing on my shoulder as I was writing because I'd be writing a scene and then think, oh, dear God, my parents are going to read this and would go back and rewrite it. Now it's more my cringe meter I go with. So if I'm writing and something's like, I'd read it back and just think, oh, my God, that's so cringy. I'll go back and reword it. So 
yeah, I think um, it's, there's benefits to having your parents read the sex scenes. Not many, but um, it might sort of help you find some guidelines or something. <laughs> I don't have any um, any sex scenes in my book. It's a bit more closed door. But um, Mum's first comment was, "I think maybe it needs some sex mail." <laughs> 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 well, that was funny. Um, but I do, I do send it to um, my different work to my mum. She's my first reader. She's a fantastic person to have a look over my work. Um, and even a couple of short stories that I've written for the romance writers, the different competitions that do have sex scenes in them, I've sent them through to mum. And she's, yep, no worries. That's fine. <laughs> Good. And how are you? Your mum, your mum is watching. Oh, my God. <laughs> Hi, Mum. <laughs> and, and, and she has said, like your mum and dad, haven't done any of that before. <laughs> I'm sure we've I all heard that too. Thank you so much for that image. I will now not be able to write anything. Thank you. Now, Lou has commented that she, that you're right. The, um, the Romance Writers of Australia is such a fabulous and supportive network. Um, what is next for both of you? Um, I've, I'm on edits at the moment for the December book. So my December book's set up in um, New England again. So, and we get to see Jason Weaver, who was a character in Someone Like You, which was a couple of years back. Um, he didn't quite get the girl in that book, but he comes back with his own story. And that was sort of one of those things that, um, I think May was sort of talking about it, where a situation happens and you try to find a place for it. I was. I sort of felt like I needed him to be in a story of his own. And um, it wasn't until I was writing this that I thought he would be the perfect character to be the male in this. Like he's got absolutely everything going for him for this book. So he became my hero for this one. And it, I didn't realise that was what was going to happen until it happened. So very excited about that one. And my Scottish book after that, which we might even get into the UK in it, maybe. <laughs> Uh, um, for me, I'm working on book three, which is um, based on Lara McIntyre. So she's uh, probably the more quicklier character from Wildflower Ridge. And she gets to have her time in the spotlight. Um, so that's for my next winter book, 2021. And I've just finished the first draft. I'm about to print it out this afternoon and start having a little look over it and see what's good, what just needs to completely go and what needs to be changed around. Excellent. And I'm sure we would all agree with Annette. Um, she just said, keep writing how you write, ladies, because you're both awesome. Oh, Annette. <laughs> I know so she didn't say anything about UK. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Carly and Maya, for joining us at Franklin City Library today. It has been, I think, close to one of my favourite um, author talks mm. that we've had. So thank you so much for being so wonderful. Um, as I said, both your um, novels are available across our digital apps at Franklin City Library. So while we are closed, your books are still available to our members. Um, and your, your physical books can also be purchased through our local bookshop, Robertson's Bookshop. Um, and they have an online feature as well. So they will send out novels um, to everyone. And of course, Carly's book is out now and Maya's will be out very soon, just in a couple of weeks. So keep that. Maybe do a pre-order on that one. So yeah, yeah the one. <laughs> I'm gonna say I'll go with Carly's because I don't have oh, yeah. <laughs> But <Love> thank you. <laughs> um, but thank you so much. We will be sharing this video across our social media channels and we'll be doing um, including links to Robertson's as well. So you can purchase that book ASAP. Um, please thank me in virtually thanking uh, Carly and Maya. Thank you. It's a, little, it's a bit awkward. I feel like we should be <laughs> applauding or something. But oh, um, no. <laughs> please keep an eye out on the Franklin City Library's website. We've got a heap of really great Frank talks coming up. But most importantly, please stay safe. Please look out for each other. And we hope to see you in our libraries when we, when we reopen. So thank you again. Lovely. Thank you for having us. Thanks, thank Maya. You. And thanks, everyone, for joining in as well. Some great questions. Yes.